I think I, I respond to stories that are rooted in character. You know, I'm not one of the directors that likes to just blow things up and, and uh, make a lot of noise necessarily. I'm interested in stories about character. And, you know, the documentary that got noticed most was one called The King of Kong about competitive video gamers. And that was very much a story about character that happened to have a three-act structure in it. And, and Hollywood you know, broadly defined, really is interested in stories that have that kind of structure, and I think that's what opened doors for me in narrative feature filmmaking. I do love stories where you have a bunch of different characters to follow, where it's a bit of an ensemble circumstance or situation that was certainly true in, in that documentary and uh, and that is definitely true here you want to give all these amazing actors as much time on screen as possible and still advance the story and and that ends up being you know an editorial uh, problem more than anything. Charlie's the first guy offered that role. Jennifer was the first. Bateman actually approached us, and I couldn't believe it because he's like one of my favorite actors of all time. And I actually w wasn't even imagining he would be interested, you know what I mean? Because the guy can carry a movie on his own, but he liked the script and this ensemble idea. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, they, it all started to happen simultaneously in over a couple weeks, which in, in terms of casting a movie is really, really fast. I mean, she's a total professional, so when she read that script and committed to it, she was really ready to go for it, and there was no sort of coaxing that had to happen. We immediately, in our first meeting, started talking about character, about, you know, the, how this woman who's a, dominant, a dominator in, in life and professionally also could plausibly choose to be a dentist where she has so much control and where it's about doing things just right. And, and we talked about it in terms of her being like a predator, a predatory cat, taking whatever she wants, eating whatever she wants, right? And, and all of that language informed the way she played the role and then ultimately crafted the look. And, uh, and that was, it was a really fun dynamic process. You know, we really got into character, like I was saying, immediately and that, that informed everything. I think that uh, both Kevin and Colin really enjoyed playing a wicked antagonist. Uh, Kevin has done it before, and he, did, you know, he found a, a, few, a few nuances that are really different in this one. And, but I think he's he's done a lot of serious films of late, and and I think it was just, you know, devilishly fun for him to to get to play this character. Um, and Colin, I feel like no one's ever seen him do what he's doing here. Even though if you've seen in Bruges, you know how funny he is. But he hasn't been given the opportunity to really depart from the sort of the image of the uber handsome guy he is and become something really different. And in our first meeting, he wanted we talked about getting a comb over and getting a, a belly made for him so he could be a little bit pudgy. And as soon as he had those things on, he really became that character. And and. Uh, it was exciting to watch. I, I feel like the best approach to comedy is to be open-minded on the set because there's always discoveries that improve the script no matter how it, good it was originally, and this one was very good. But as these characters were evolving and they were discovering how they were playing things over time, we were constantly tweaking and adjusting not only lines, but possible approaches and intentions to, to play it with. And uh, we did that sort of all the way through production. And it, it, it's a testament really to these guys' talents. They're, uh, they're all writers and they're all able to understand character arc over time and, and understand it so well that they know how in performance to do the nuances and the shading that makes it really come to life and feel real. I think when these guys are talking with each other, they really feel like friends. They really feel like their chemistry is excellent. And that's, that's a product of a lot of hard work over a lot of years.
They played a game with each other during photography where they would try to make one another laugh, you know, during takes as a sort of uh, one-upsmanship in who could, you know, who would score the most points, if you will. And I think that was a great, a great game because it got them really engaged in conversation and listening and messing with each other and stuff. And I think you can just feel it when you watch the film, how much fun we were having while we were making it. We really took a no holds barred, unapologetic attitude about the comedy in this film, and we really went for it at every turn. And we never shied away from a joke or a situation um, out of propriety. It was really about just going for whatever is the funniest, and that's what we did in, in editorially too. You know, we left in the strongest, the strongest funnies, <laughs> whatever those were, and. Uh, we never got into the X-rated, but I, I think uh, we would have we would have been willing to had we had that on the page. <laughs> the DVD is going to be amazing on this. There were so many great scenes and versions of scenes and alternate ways of doing things that there wasn't space for in the finished film. Um, but which I think fans of the movie will really enjoy when they get the DVD. It was actually Bateman and Charlie's idea when Charlie drops the cocaine accidentally that they find in Bobby Pellet's house. It was their idea that as they're desperately trying to clean up the mess they made so they aren't discovered, that they start getting impacted by the cocaine itself. That was a genius idea, and uh, that was it's one of my fun, one of the funnest ones for me to watch because I remember how that evolved over time. The writers doing the original version of that, the, our guys elevating that, and then seeing you know their riffing as they're in their sort of high mind state, uh, their confessions to each other as friends and stuff. That is just it's just comedy gold. I think Car you know anyone who knows It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia knows how talented Charlie is, but he hasn't had that opportunity to really break out. I'm a fan of his for a long time. I like that show, and he's really... Um, I really hope he gets attention from this movie because he's a very special actor, uh, incredible comedian, and, and, and really a fun guy to work with. So I, I'm, you know, got my fingers crossed that, that everyone sees what I see. It was very deliberate camera moves because what we were really trying to do is have suggest what he was seeing but not ever allow it to be seen and I think he did a wonderful job playing that like oh, trying to look but can't look but must look like that playing that tension was he did a wonderful job at that and then it's just one example of how he elevated the script. It was it was crazy, you know. It was almost surreal to to see how she attacked that part, and with such ease and grace and comfort, and uh, and she did a really good job making Charlie uh, putting Charlie in that spot. 